again, church. Let's turn in our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3 this morning. Ephesians chapter 3 as we continue in our series, The Church from Grace to Glory. Ephesians chapter 3. Well, the Pulitzer Prize winning novel, The Road, by Cormac McCarthy, along with its film adaptation, gives a poignant picture of one father's unrelenting love for his son. Set in a post-apocalyptic world in which all the animals have been wiped out and crops have been devastated, the man and his boys survive by scavenging wherever they can as they try to make it south to find a safe place to settle. But this barren wasteland of a world is not only harsh in climate and landscape, it has also descended into complete anarchy, as much of humanity has divided itself into warring tribes who fight over what limited resources remain. Indeed, food is so scarce, many of them have already resorted to human trafficking for the purpose of cannibalism, and children have become easy prey for their newfound diet. But not if this father has anything to say about it. He knows his one mission is to protect his son at all costs. And he faithfully guards his son's physical life from these evil men. But he also protects and nurtures his inner life. Reading him books at the end of the day. Tales of heroes and goodness in the world as they sit by a campfire. A welcome source of warmth and light in the midst of an otherwise cold and indifferent darkness. Because the world is bleak. Indeed, the novel tells us that there were times when he sat watching the boy sleep that he would begin to sob uncontrollably, but, it says, it wasn't about death, but rather the seeming absence of beauty or goodness. After all, it says, these were now things the boy would no longer have any way to think about at all. But nevertheless, while the rest of the world falls into barbarism and anarchy and destitution, the father is determined that he and the boy will not. And so he reminds the boy, we're the good guys. And then he tells him this, we are carrying the fire. In other words, in a world of darkness, we're going to be light. In a world of evil, we're going to be the good. In a world that's become so animalistic, we're going to retain our humanity. And they do. But that doesn't keep the world from trying to beat them down. Indeed, by the end of the novel, the father's body is weary and broken from this journey with all its trials. He's sick. He's coughing up blood. He's dying. And knowing that his son will now have to journey on without him, he leaves him with these final words. You have to carry the fire. I don't know how to, the son replies. Yes, you do, the father responds. Is it real? The fire, the son asks. Yes, it is, the father assures him. Where is it? I don't know where it is, the son calls out. Yes, you do, the father says. It's inside you. It was always there. I can see it. See, the father had done all he could to protect his son and prepare him for this moment. He taught him to carry the fire, but now it was up to him to carry it alone until he could find others to carry it with him. Because going the way of the world was not an option. He couldn't descend into the darkness because he was the good guy and he was carrying the fire. Now, thankfully, we don't live in the barbaric world of McCarthy's novel, but that doesn't mean our world is any less dark. Indeed, the Apostle Paul just spent the last chapter reminding us just how bleak our present reality is. He says the world is dead. It's full of children of wrath, sons of disobedience, who are separated from Christ. That's why he says the world is without hope, because it is without God. Indeed, the world is following Satan, the prince and pow- prince of the power of the air. And this is the same course we all once walked, except God made us alive. Indeed, by his grace, we have become the good guys. Not because we're good in in and of ourselves, but because we have been brought near by a good God. We've been chosen, he says. We've been adopted, redeemed, forgiven, sealed. We're in Christ, which means the Spirit is now in us. And more than that, Paul says in 1.9 that by grace, our eyes have been opened to the mystery of God's will, according to his purpose to unite all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. And how did we come to see and to know these things? Because someone carried the fire to us. And it's the same with the Ephesians. As those who were foreigners of Israel, they would have never known God's plan to save even them, to call them out of darkness and into his light, had someone not brought the fire to them. 
And that someone was Paul. Indeed, Paul feels the weighty responsibility as the keeper of the flame, especially now that we find out his predicament in chapter 3, verse 1, where he says this, For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles. See, Paul is writing this epistle from prison. And why is he in prison? For preaching the gospel. Indeed, as he was taking the gospel to the Gentiles, facing the wrath of not only Jewish leaders, but also the Roman and local governments. That's why Paul can say that he is a prisoner for the sake of Christ on behalf of the Gentiles. Nevertheless, you can imagine the Ephesian church is discouraged here. I mean, if the gospel is so powerful that it can bring the dead to life, if they are adopted children of God, then what are they to make of the fact that following Jesus, walking in his ways, has led their leader to shackles and will one day lead to his martyrdom? Is this what victory looks like? And so Paul sets out to remind them that this too is part of God's plan. In a world that has gone mad, he refuses to go mad with it because he says in verse 2, he has received the stewardship of God's grace. And he says, this grace was given to me for you. See, to be a steward is to be entrusted with something, to oversee it, to manage it. And here Paul says that he's been entrusted to carry God's message of grace to the ends of the earth. He's the keeper of the flame, and that flame is the only hope for a hopeless world. So no matter how hard it gets, as a steward of grace, he's determined he will carry the fire. And he's calling us to do the same, reminding us, first of all, that we're stewards of grace as we receive the gospel. We're stewards of grace as we receive the gospel, because in order to be a steward of something, you have to first accept it. And that's exactly what Paul tells us happened in his life. He says in verse 3, the mystery that through the cross Christ was tearing down every dividing wall and uniting all things to himself. He says, this mystery was made known to me, how? By revelation, as I have written briefly. Now remember, for us to know anything about God, God had to reveal himself to us. Because we have two things working against us. We're finite, which means left to ourselves, even before the fall, it would have been impossible in our limited minds to reason their way to God and understand anything about him unless God condescended himself and made himself known to us. But that's exactly what we see him doing in the garden. We see him walking and talking with Adam and Eve. But friends, he was under no obligation to do this for us. He could have been the God of the deists who set the world in motion but never, never interacted with it again. But our God is a loving, he is a relational God. And by his grace and in his kindness, he revealed himself to us in the beginning. But then after the fall, we introduced a second barrier to knowing God, our fallenness. When our ancestors, Adam and Eve, sinned, it corrupted every aspect of our existence, including the desires of our hearts and the thoughts of our minds. That's why, as we've seen, left to ourselves, we are not only blind to the truth, we actively suppress the truth. That's why Colossians 1.21 says we were hostile in mind. And Romans 1.21 says we became futile in our thinking, our foolish hearts were darkened. No wonder, then, Romans 3.10 says, in our own power, none of us would seek For God. So again, if we're going to know anything about God, he's going to have to disclose himself to us. But after the fall, even that is not sufficient because we are spiritually blind. Therefore, he also has to open our eyes so that we can see him, to recognize the truth, to desire the truth, which he does as the Spirit of God works through the word, the revelation of God to incline our hearts to God. And that's exactly what God did in the life of Paul when the risen Christ himself appeared to him on the Damascus road and asked him, why do you persecute me? See, Paul had been zealous in his attack upon the church. As a devout Jewish leader, he was determined to wipe out the followers of Jesus and was even present at the first Christian martyr, Stephen. But now Paul came face to face with the very image of God. The word made flesh. And though he was temporarily physically blinded by the encounter, he began to see spiritually for the first time that Jesus is the Christ. He's the son of the living God. That salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus and not by anything good Paul had done. And as Paul comes to recognize these things, he's given a special calling. 
And this really gets to the heart of what this mystery is that Paul has been speaking about. He says this in verse 4. He says, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So we see, first of all, Paul was commissioned by Christ to be an apostle. Now remember, as we saw in a previous passage, the apostles were the foundation of the church because they were eyewitnesses to the resurrected Jesus and because they were commissioned by Jesus to establish the church and to faithfully teach and proclaim the gospel that he had proclaimed to them. To tell the world that though we are sinners who deserve to die and be separated from God forever, God sent his sinless son Jesus to take on flesh, to fully obey the law on our behalf, to then take the punishment and penalty we deserve on the cross even as he transferred to us all his righteousness. And in rising from the grave, he conquered sin and death, making it possible for all who believe no longer to perish, but have everlasting life. This was the message that he entrusted to them. But Jesus also entrusted these apostles with another important task that was critical to the establishment of the church. Jesus promised these men that he would send his Holy Spirit to guide them in all truth. In John 17, 8, Jesus explains, I have given them the words that God gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from God, and they have believed that God sent me. And so by the Holy Spirit, he revealed to them everything they were to write down without error so that we who were not eyewitnesses to everything Jesus did could read these things for ourselves and as John 20 31 says believe that Jesus is the Messiah the Son of God and that by believing we may have life in his name in other words they were given revelation from God so they could write the books that now make up the New Testament so that we could read these books and come to receive the good news of the gospel just as they did but even more than that Jesus was also giving them understanding so they could rightly and authoritatively interpret the Old Testament to demonstrate how everything is ultimately fulfilled in Jesus this was the example that Christ himself set for them Luke 24 27 we see after Jesus rose from the dead he met with these men and it says beginning with Moses and all the prophets he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself and part of this understanding from the Holy Spirit was insight into this mystery that every other generation had been blind to until this point. Even though God had promised Abraham that he was not only going to bless him and his physical descendants, but also through him bless all the nations, and even though Israel had been called to be a light to the nations, and even though it had been prophesied that one day all nations would gather in Jerusalem to honor the name of the Lord, and even though Gentiles like Rahab and Ruth were part of David's and therefore the Messiah's line, many still were blind to the fact that God's mission all along was to save not only people from Israel, but also people from every tongue and tribe throughout the earth. Now certainly we see in the Old Testament that Gentiles were welcome to join the Israelites any time, but they would have had to first become Jews. They would have had to be circumcised. They would have had to abide by dietary restrictions and the rest of the law. But beginning with Jesus' great commission to make disciples of every people group, and then the vision that God gave to Peter that just as no animal was inherently unclean anymore, and aren't you thankful for that, by the way, so that we can eat stuff like shrimp and bacon? Likewise, it meant no person was unclean simply because of ethnicity. Meaning even the Gentiles could be saved, not by being circumcised or by swearing off pork products, but by faith alone in Christ alone. Why? Because Christ has fulfilled the law on our behalf. And therefore these divisions and these distinctions are no longer binding because as Paul said in the previous chapter, he has torn down every dividing wall. In other words, if you are in Christ, he has completely obeyed the law on your behalf. He has reconciled you to himself, not by your works, but by his. And he is making all that was unclean, clean. He is making all things new. And so we see the mystery hidden throughout the ages is that through the blood of Jesus, not only are Gentiles let into the kingdom, they are also placed on equal par with the Jews. 
Indeed, Paul says this in verse 6. Verse six this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs. Members of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Because as we've seen in the kingdom, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. Indeed, we come to realize that just as a, the Gentile did not need to become a Jew in order to enter the kingdom, it turns out being Jewish is not sufficient for salvation. Indeed, Jesus and Paul told us that not everyone who was a physical descendant of Abraham was necessarily a legitimate heir of Abraham. Only those who had faith in Christ were the true heirs of the promise God made to him. That's why Paul said in chapter 2 that having broken down the dividing wall, Jesus was making of the two, Jew and Gentile, one new man in place of the two. So making peace. It says in verse 16, he's reconciling us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. So we see salvation comes not through ethnicity, nor by by being born under the law, it is by grace through faith that we are saved, not by works. In other words, the gospel is for all people. This is the glorious revelation given to the apostles, including Paul. And so as Paul sits in prison, he does not lose heart because he knows he carries the fire. He received the grace of God and he has received the revelation from God and we are called to do the same. No, we're not going to hear the audible voice of God. And even though the Spirit dwells within us, we don't share the unique calling of the apostles to receive new revelation to then write down as Scripture. Because with the death of the apostles, the canon of Scripture is officially closed because they alone were given the unique responsibility to establish the church and to provide God's revelation to the church. But nevertheless, nevertheless, we have a responsibility to receive this revelation that God gave to them. Indeed, this is what the church has done from the beginning. Acts 2.42 says the early church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship. And we do this by first receiving the good news of the gospel and trusting in Jesus for salvation. Romans 10.17 says faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So no one is saved apart from this revelation given to the apostles. Again, we come to faith when the Spirit of God works through the Word of God to incline our hearts to God. And friend, you can receive this revelation, this grace today. John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Listen, no matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, you don't need to be unclean any longer. Jesus loves you. He died for you. He wants you. And all you need to do is turn from your sin and trust in him. And though you were once far off, alienated, separated from him, whether as a Jew or a Gentile, you can be brought near today. You can come home today. You can receive the fire today. But having received the fire, we see we're also called to be caretakers of the fire, to hold fast to the revelation of God's word and to walk in accordance with it. Indeed, Jesus said that if we love him, we will obey his commands, and that if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. 1 John 2, 24 likewise says, as for you, see that when, what you have heard from the beginning, listen, remains in you. I am writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. Church, I don't need to tell you that there are many that are trying to lead the church astray these days from all sectors of society. Many on the left play the serpentine game of asking, did God really say in regard to issues of gender and sexuality and the sanctity of life in the womb? And to them we say with the Protestant reformer Martin Luther, here we stand. We can do no other. God help us. Why? Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the creator, not us. And so we live according to his word. We live according to his purpose. We live according to his design, no matter what the culture around us may say. By the same token, some on the right are promoting the heresy of Christian nationalism, which promotes forcing people to convert to Christianity under penalty of law. 
Baptists in particular have historically and biblically spoken out against this heresy since the beginning of our existence, believing state religion not only weakens the church through false converts, but also leads to persecution of others, including Christians who believe differently than whatever the state's definition of religion is. Nevertheless, one self-described Baptist Christian nationalist, Baptist Christian nationalist, has been trying to persuade other Baptists to join his cause telling them not to worry about such persecution because Baptists, he says, are, quote, million strong. And so he's, quote, pretty confident that if anybody's going to be doing the persecuting, it'll be us, end quote. Friends, that's about as antithetical to the gospel as you can get. That's a pretty big leap from blessed are those who are persecuted to blessed are those who are persecuting. To them, we say with Jesus, Christ's kingdom is not of this world. Indeed, Jesus said to put away the sword. His kingdom will not advance by physically conquering Jew and Gentile and assimilating them into our man-made kingdoms under threats of convert or die, but by leading Jew or Gentile to faith in an everlasting kingdom where we will never die because salvation does not come through boots on the neck. But again, as the Spirit of God works through the Word of God to incline our hearts to God. Friends, there are dangers everywhere. There's shifting sand everywhere, faulty foundations everywhere. But we are firmly planted on that apostolic foundation where Christ alone is the cornerstone because we've received this holy revelation. We're stewards of the grace entrusted to us. So we're not deviating to the left or to the right. In fact, as one pastor said, we're transcending the whole godless system because our eyes are fixed on Jesus and his kingdom because church, we carry the fire so we're stewards of grace by receiving and holding fast to the gospel but we're also we see stewards of grace as we proclaim the gospel indeed paul tells us in verse 7 of this gospel i was made a minister according to the gift of god's grace which was given me by the working of his power see it is only by god's grace that paul is now able to proclaim the message of god's grace Not only because left to himself, he, like all of us, would have never received God's grace and therefore needed the power of God to do so, but also because of the nature of Paul's initial response to God's grace. Indeed, he says in verse 8, what? I am the very least of all the saints. Now, why does he say that? Because not only was Paul once like us, an enemy of God in his sin, No, as we've seen, he was also once actively trying to suppress and annihilate the work of God by destroying the church of God. So Paul isn't faking humility here. He's serious. He's like, guys, I'm so bad. I don't even know how I got into this kingdom, much less that I get to lead in this kingdom. I'm only here by grace. And friend, I'm here to tell you today that if God could do that for Paul by grace, there's nothing in your life keeping him from doing the same for you. Listen, your sin might be great, but Jesus is greater. But notice, the gift of grace isn't so that he can just sit back and chill until Jesus comes back and takes him to heaven. No, the gift of grace is always a call to action. And God saved Paul for a purpose. In Acts 9.15, it says, God revealed that Paul was to be my chosen instrument to proclaim my name, not only to Israel, but also to the Gentiles and their kings. And that's what Paul tells us here. He says in verse 8, To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. In other words, in light of the fact that God has revealed that the gospel is for all people, Paul isn't going to sit on that and hoard the blessing for himself, relaxing around the comfort of the fire, all warm and cozy, while others are out there dying in the dark and the cold. No, he, like Abraham, is blessed to be a blessing. So he's carrying that fire, verse 9, to bring light for everyone. What is the, bring to light to everyone. What is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things? See, Paul says, having been given this revelation, I have a responsibility now to proclaim this revelation, this mystery hidden for ages in God to people from every nation. And church, Paul says we do too. Indeed, the reason Paul preaches the gospel is this. Look at verse 10. So that 
through the church. The church, made up of Jew and Gentiles, one new man through the church. The manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom it says, we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. See, God's plan has always been the church. We are his eternal purpose, his one design, realized in the work of Jesus on the cross. Because it is only by his sacrifice that we now have access to God. Confident access, it says, bold access. Indeed, Hebrews 4.16 says, through Christ, we now approach the throne of grace with confidence. But like Paul, this isn't just so that we can have warm, cuddly moments with Jesus. While a world out there dies and goes to hell. No, it is through the church that not only is the gospel received, it is proclaimed. Because it is through the gospel teaching of the church and the transformed lives of those proclaiming the gospel that it says here, the manifold wisdom of God is made known to the entire world. As that watching world sees something contrary to the division they see everywhere else and watches in all as people who would otherwise have absolutely nothing in common rally around a common mission to know Christ and to make him known. To grow as disciples, to make disciples, because we know there's only one name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved, and that name is Jesus, and we want everyone to know him. And so we proclaim it at school, at work, on the field, in our neighborhoods, in our families, wherever God has placed us, we proclaim the good news that Christ is redeeming everyone who turns from their sin and believes in his name. But notice here, our proclamation isn't just going throughout the earth. No, our proclamation transcends this realm and becomes otherworldly because it says our message reaches even the rulers and authorities of the heavenly places. That means as the gospel is proclaimed with our lips and with our lives, as the dividing wall of hostility is torn down in our midst, it is not only a testimony to the watching world, it is also a declaration to the spiritual realm that Jesus is in fact king triumphant over the demonic powers, celebrated by the heavenly hosts, who day and night cry, worthy is the lamb who was slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Church, did you know the angels are marveling over us right now? Not because there's anything inherently special about us, but because there's something glorious about what God has done in us. That's why 1 Peter 1.12 says that even angels long to look into these things. What things? It says the things that have now been told to you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. See, even the angels can't believe what they're seeing with their eyes that God has brought the dead to life that he has brought the stranger in the alien home, that he has brought the far off near, made Jew and Gentile one, and that he's now entrusted us, us, with these things to make his grace known among the nations, to carry the fire by not only standing firm in the truth of God, but also in proclaiming the truth of God, his love. Because there's a world in death and darkness, but church, we carry the fire. So let's carry the fire. So we see as stewards, we must receive the gospel. We must proclaim the gospel. But finally this morning, we see this, that we are stewards of grace as we endure for the sake of the gospel. Paul says this in verse 13. He says, so I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. See, Paul wants the Ephesians to know that his imprisonment was not a defeat. It wasn't a setback. There was, there was no reason to lose heart because as Paul told us in Ephesians 1, everything that happens is what? According to the purpose of God's will. Indeed, he tells us God is working all things according to the counsel of his will. That means nothing is happening to Paul that God has not actively willed or allowed to happen. So this is exactly where Paul was meant to be at this moment because God had a plan and a purpose for him him there. Indeed, when Paul was writing to the Philippians from prison, he told them, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. 
Why? Because he said in Philippians 1.13, the gospel message is being spread among the whole imperial guard. Indeed, he tells us by the end of the letter that all the saints greet you, by the way, especially those of, get this, Caesar's household. What? See, it wasn't an accident that Paul was in prison. God had sovereignly placed him there. Why? Because according to Ephesians 1, before the earth's foundation, God had chosen some in that very spot and at that very time to be adopted, to be redeemed, to be sealed by it for a glorious inheritance. So he sent Paul to carry the fire there. And by his grace, God actually placed Paul in prison to proclaim his message of grace that those who were dead might be brought to life as the Spirit of God worked through the Word of God to incline their hearts to God to receive the gospel of God. So Paul's suffering was not in vain. God was using it all to fulfill his plan and his purpose. And Paul wanted the Ephesians to know it's worth it. Indeed, Paul was willing to suffer greatly if that was the cost to get the gospel to Gentiles like the Ephesians. And church, he's inviting us to do the same. I don't know what hard spot you find yourself in this morning. And I'm not saying that every hard spot is one you should stay in. For instance, if you're in an abusive relationship, you should get out. But I say this, my fear for many of us is that we live in a culture that prizes comfort above everything. So when things get tough, our natural tendency is always to run, to avoid suffering at all costs. But listen, What if it's not an accident that you're in the challenging situation you're in right now at work, at school, in your family, with your health? What if that's not a setback, but an opportunity? What if instead of lamenting this suffering has come your way, which is totally okay to do as we see in the Psalms, but what if instead of just doing that, you also ask God to open your eyes to what purpose he has for you in the midst of this suffering? to be a steward of his grace to those who are watching, to carry the fire into the darkness of this moment. Indeed, we tend to view our trials as hindrances to a good life. But from an eternal perspective, Paul and the other apostles wanted us to understand that trials are actually the path to the good life. Not only for us, but for others, as God showcases his grace and his glory through us as we endure suffering. That's why Paul says here that his imprisonment is not for their shame, but what? It is for their glory. Why? Because if we are in Christ, then our present suffering is not only evidence that we belong to Jesus as we share his sufferings, it is also proof that we will likewise share in his glory one day. That's why Jesus told us that we are blessed when we are persecuted. Why? Because, he says, it is proof that we will inherit the kingdom of heaven. Indeed, he says in verse 11, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of, th- kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, he says. Why? For your reward in heaven will be great. For this reason, Peter likewise admonished us not to be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. Why? That you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. That's why Paul actually went so far to say he wanted to share in Christ's sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, he says, I may attain the resurrection from the dead because again suffering for Christ now is a is guaranteed for glory then friend your present trials are not an accident they're not only part of God's plan to refine you to become more like Christ but they are also an opportunity for people to see the power of the gospel of grace at work in you as you do not respond in anger or resentment or bitterness or retaliation, but rather in forgiveness, peace, love, showing a hopeless world where hope can be found. Listen, man, Paul could have gone off on the Romans for the injustice of his imprisonment 
And certainly he reminded them that as a Roman citizen, he was entitled to certain rights. But listen, Paul knew his primary mission was not against Roman powers, but as he will tell us in chapter 6, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness. So his goal was not to fight like a Roman, but to love and to serve like Jesus. And how did Jesus serve? Jesus told us he came to serve by what? Giving his life as a ransom for many. See, the kingdom comes not by taking up arms, but by laying down our lives. If this is the way our Lord and our Savior operated, should it be any different for us? If this path to glory, if his path to glory was through the cross, why should we expect anything different? Jesus told us as much in John 15, 20. He said, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Indeed, he warned us, the world will hate you because it hated me first. So Paul says we should not lose heart as we navigate through these dark days. In fact, these trials should only embolden us all the more to endure. Why? Because we are the light of the world. And where does the light shine brightest? In the darkest places. And so we will not be discouraged because we're stewards of grace. We carry the fire. Indeed, we receive the gospel. We proclaim the gospel. We endure for the sake of the gospel. And we will keep doing so until every person has the chance to hear, until it goes out to every city, every nation, every tongue, every people, until this glorious mystery hidden for all eternity is at last made known to everyone near and far, that God is reconciling to himself all who believe, whether Jew or Gentile. And friend, he wants to reconcile with you. So will you receive the fire? Church, will you carry the fire? Will you pray with me?